morning, folks, again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this uh, uh, last edition of our class on this um, on this book of Second Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, ends with chapter three here, and uh, <clears throat> and we're going to take a look at the last chapter of the book. We've been uh, kind of uh, reading on the side called the Rapture, the Wedding Day of the Lord, by Pastor Mark Kirk of um, Calvary Chapel, Knoxville. Now, both of those, um, each one of those is an hour class, so we're going to have to scrunch this together to finish. And really, um, as I'm reading and studying in, um, this material, could easily easily take a, a lesson out of what's in the, the text, and then, and then this chapter. It's not a long chapter, but um, you can't pick and choose from it. It's a, it's a self-contained unit. It takes you through a wedding celebration, a wedding feast. Uh, the wedding, the procedure that happens from engagement to consummation. And, um, and it shows, and it kind of capsizes all the rest that he has said in here about the, in the scriptures about, about um, the rapture as being distinct and separate from the second coming of the Lord. Um, as, as an overall picture, putting it all together. And when you see it in the picture, uh, um, a common ordinary um, uh, engage, betrothal, engagement, and, uh, and wedding in, in, um, uh, in not only Hebrew culture, but in the ancient Near East at that time, you can see exactly what's happening here and how the rapture would fit in um, separately and differently as a different part of the second coming with a seven year period in between the two. So I think we're gonna, I'm gonna begin there and hopefully leave enough time to go through the last chapter of Second Thessalonians, which is exhortations based on the teaching and instruction that came from the first two chapters about the coming of the Lord, about the seven-year tribulation, about the appearance of the man of sin, the Antichrist, and then the, the um, rapture of the church that um, happens before that, and then this coming in. All the, all the instruction that Paul's giving in the first few chapters of Second Thessalonians in order to set straight some false teaching that's circulating around. And now the last chapter is now exhortations to us as the church on how we should live because of it, because of this instruction that he's just given. So what, where are we to go from here? What are we to do with this? And it's very practical. It's not just pie in the sky, go ahead and, um, um, you know what? It's nothing matters anyway. Um, it's all going to dissolve our present, con you know, our present uh, the hostility in our country. It, it's going to dissolve. America doesn't have a future anyway. It is written. Why go vote? <laughs> I mean, that's the ultimate. Um, you know, why get involved in politics? And what's the point and the purpose anyways? It's not um, America. If it if it's had any good at all, and it has. Um, in the last couple of hundred years, really 400 years since the Pilgrims, has served its place in time, and has done. You know, and uh, from here, it's it's done nothing but in the last generation or so, 40, 50, 60 years, it declined and become not a lighthouse for truth and for the gospel, but a, a beacon of uh, darkness for everything that's anti-God and anti-Christ. Um, and we're seeing, so should we not get involved in that? No, no. I, as long as we've got breath, part of being in the light is representing him. And um, in our case, we, have a rep we still have a representative government. It might be bought and paid for by, you know, by big money somewhere, but we, we still have to use whatever means we have to be a voice for truth and be light in this darkness um, and, and leave the rest to God. But we can do it with hope because we know that 
darkness cannot, com cannot comprehend or overcome the light. And in the meantime, some might be saved and some might come to the light that we have, even though this present nation is in decline and, and might end up like Sodom and Gomorrah at, at the end. And it will if, um, you know, um, in, in, in the end, <coughs> You know, as we what we've seen all along, it's why why I love, love to hand out those charts because it, it keeps in my it keeps myself in mind what the, what all of the history of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation how it all plans out and it pans up talk about a pandemic it's from Genesis to from God, from God creating Adam and Eve until his re, Christ's return the new heavens and the new earth and it's all in there it's pre written. Um, and we can we can rest in that. Do we have a part in it? Yes. Are we responsible for what we do and the part we play? Absolutely. Will we be uh, judged according to what we did here in the right? Absolutely. Um, but will it change the effect that his, God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven? No. <clears throat> his will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only question is 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 am I going to be a part of it? Or am I going to be just here doing my will and my plan? So, it, you know, it behooves us to get our eyes on Christ, on the things of God that he has given us to know and to, um, we're supposed to know these things. And he's given us the knowledge of it so that we will be wise and not foolish in the way we live. So that's his, um, his instructions in chapter 3 are really twofold. I'm going to use the NIV study Bible this morning for this last chapter. Um, it's simple and to the point. Um, but if you look at the outline uh, on 2 Thessalonians introduction, page 1829, it's a very simple three-point outline, the introduction to, to the church. The instruction part of the church, and then the, what he calls the, the, the injunctions or, or the exhortation part of the, of the letter, which is chapter 3. Um, and there you have um, basically two things, a call to prayer and a call to discipleship, and um, especially um, towards those who are disorderly and lazy. The exhortations are for, um, if you look at chapter 3, look at chapter 3, you'll see two things. Requests for prayer. It drives us to prayer. Everything that we have seen so far about, about, about the return of Christ, the snatching away of, of his saints, um, the, re, the removal of that which is restraining him, the appearance of the man of sin, the Antichrist, and then the return of Christ, whose coming is going to be in glory, and will be it will mean wrath for all those that are standing against him, but redemption for all those that are waiting for him in hope. It calls us to two things. Number one, prayer. Standing in prayer, standing in constant fellowship with the Lord. In other words, what is being, being prayerful is to be awake. Don't not be sleeping. That's what, you know, this, remember the parables in Matthew 25. about uh, Some of them fell asleep and they didn't have oil in their lamps. They didn't stay up through the night time hours. And, and they weren't ready. And they missed the coming and the return. Um, because they weren't ready. Um, by the way, does that mean that there'll be saints who will, be, who will miss the rapture? No, no, I don't think that's what uh, that means. Mark Kirk uh, uh, speaks about that in this chapter we're about to read. Um, he says that um, is referent is more not in reference to the individual believer, but to the church. There'll be churches who will be left behind as groups because they're not born again. They're doing everything. He, he likens that church to the church in the latter days at, at the return of the, the church that exists on the earth at this time at the end. Is, is going to be like Laodicea, the final, the seventh church in uh, Revelation 3. And uh, it's a church that has the semblance of church on the outside, but is not a real true church on the inside. They're, uh, 
what he calls lukewarm, and I can't either take you in at, uh, because you're not hot. You've got all the stuff on the outside, but, but hot and warmth comes from the inside. It comes from a lifeblood that's alive and it's on fire. There, that you, you say you're alive, but you're not. You're dead. Um, so he's calling that the, the visible church to repent. And that church that is visible, that, you know, um, I mean, you can find their address in the yellow pages or on your What's that? cell phone <laughs> or on your Wikipedia or your GPS or where, or, yeah, or, yeah or what's your, the yellow page? Yeah, or your abacus. Yeah. <laughs> um, you won't find them in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life. So that, that is representative of so much of what looks at, what the world looks at as the church is not the church at all and will be left, and will be in the tribulation. I can't um, take you in and I can't send you out, but I'll have to spit you out because you're lukewarm. You're not fit for consumption. So he looks at the church of Laodicea as, as an end times apostate church. Um, because of because of that so it's not that um, that there's some believers who are going to miss it but there will be some churches who will not have a candlestick and that happened to Ephesus too who had lost their first love but like we talked about that um, they lost their first love and today there's no church in Ephesus there, there's no candlestick there that, that was the rep, that was the representative of the church by the way um, I'm reading up uh, for, uh, for some backup material. It's a book by John Stott, the rector of All Souls Church England, and then he from, um, I think he died in the 1920s, and <coughs> he lived and wrote in the 1890s to 1920s. John Stott? John Stott. He wrote Basic Christianity. Yeah, I thought he was one. Some great, some, he's got some great books. Anyway, this one is called the, um, from the, actually 19, 1958, this one came. So he, he, uh, he lived a little bit later than I thought. So he wrote that post-mortem. He, yeah, yeah post-mortem. Um, this is called the, What Christ Thinks of the Church, and it's just the first three chapters of Revelation. The church is in Revelation one by one. Uh, together with the first chapter, which is the revelation of Jesus, uh, the one who is and was and was to come. And it gives great background, historical background, and uh, uh, an expository background to the seven churches in Revelation. Uh, anything you can read by John Stott is going to be tremendous. Uh, That's T-O-T-T? -T? Yeah. yeah. He died in 2011. <coughs> Now, yeah, now that you mentioned it, I read a book about five years ago that was one of the best books I've ever read. And it, it was something that he wrote after retiring from the ministry um, about the church, about the state of the church in, uh, in our generation and about everything that the church needed from um, somebody that has done both pastoral ministry and uh, uh, has authored I don't know how many books. I forget the name of that one, but anyway, um, he mentions that uh, in the book of there's two there's two letters of the chap uh, two letters of the seven churches in in uh, Revelation two and three. They each they each they each receive a vision of Jesus that's a little different than the others. Each one has a unique picture of Christ. You know, to one, it's the one who is alive, who was dead, and now is alive. To one, it's the, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and, uh, the beginning and the end. To, to, to another one, each one gets a different view of Christ, and probably according to what the need is, and to what the calling is of that, of that church body. And each one gets a commendation. They're praised by the Lord for what they're doing good and right, and they need to stand in that and strengthen it. And each one gets then a rebuke of what they need of what they're missing or what they're doing wrong or what they're tolerating in the church <coughs> that, need, that they need to get out. Um, and then each one um, then gets a reward, a promise for a reward if they overcome and they persevere. Um, that's the way that those letters are structured. 
but there's two of the seven churches that don't have any rebuke at all, that there's nothing wrong with them. Um, so isn't that interesting? So I went and read those. I'm going to take this, this wool jacket off. You know what those two churches are that didn't get any um, rebuke or correction from the Lord? And uh, so I wanted to look at those and say, what, what is it that they were doing and that was happening there that warranted uh, the Lord's nothing but to commend them and had no, he had no um, further in, you know, correction for them? Off the top of your head, no. Nope. Smyrna. Philadelphia was one, and Smyrna or, um, was the other. And Smyrna, he, uh, let me go with this. Smyrna was the church, Ephesus was the first, Smyrna was the second. <coughs> and to Ephesus, the, the exhortation was love. You need to come back to your first love, and that would be fine. To Smyrna, the exhortation was to suffer, and it was the suffering and the persecution that they were enduring that warranted Christ's praise. And um, and his in his exhortation to them was nothing more than to you're doing a good job, boys. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep persevering. And um, and he and uh, and to him that overcomes, he's going to have a place. Um, Does their name indicate suffering, Smyrna? Um, I have to look that up. I don't see that off the top here. But uh, his, uh, I'm going to have to go through this quick because it's not a, it's not part it's not part of the notes for today, <laughs> and I'm getting I'm getting uh, a little bit detoured here. Um, but this is just an example of what this book has to has to offer <coughs> in this. Um, but for Smyrna, he, encour he encourages them for the sake of uh, tribulation. For He's got four things that he lists here. And, uh, and John Stott, um, you know, has like a page, a page and a half on each one of these four things that Jesus says. And he gives the historicity behind what's going on there in, in the church of Smyrna. Number one, poverty. Jesus says, I know that you're, I know your poverty. They were plundered. The church was plundered. The Roman soldiers would come because they were, they weren't, they weren't a, a people that had a lot of high social status, and because they could, why do they take advantage of you? Because they can, and they can, they can get away with it. And you can't do any. There's nothing that you can do about it. So they, they, they were poor, and they were taken advantage of, and they stayed that way of all of all the other churches. They weren't rich like some of the other coastal cities that had a lot of commerce and trade from the shipping industry. Um, so um, Jesus says, I know your poverty, your extreme poverty, that um, um, and uh, he points out that Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, not many wise according to worldly standards, not many powerful according to worldly standards, not many of noble birth. And that would be not many privileged. Are you discussing Smyrna right now? Yeah. I looked up my footnote here in the study Bible. It says Smyrna, a proud and beautiful Asian city, modern Ismer, closely aligned with Rome and eager to meet in dem the demands for emperor worship. This, plus a large and actively hostile Jewish population, made it extremely difficult to live there as a Christian. Polycarp, the most famous of the early martyrs, was a bishop of Smyrna. Yes. So it's, I was just just, like the, it's been a long time city. I was just about to get to that. Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Because uh, the, pover the poverty that they had, but, but Jesus says, but you are rich. Mm -hmm. You've got what all the other, these other towns that have this world's status and it, and uh, and their riches and their goods and their and their reputation don't have you are rich. So lots of groups that right. persecute them. They were persecuted mm -hmm. big time. Both uh, and then the slander number two, 
though, the, the, by those who say they are Jews but are not. Um, so they were then false rumors, false uh, uh, rumors about them were poisoning the minds of people because they were the, they were the wayward Jews who were teaching the false cult. So they had they were they were um, uh, as far as status concerned, they were they had nothing, they were nothing in people's eyes, and then they were uh, spoken of as if as if they were. Uh, now, some of you remember what it was like being a part of the Jesus movement in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, we weren't part of any real church, and we were looked at as by those who were in the established churches as a cult, at least possibly. Um, but, so there wasn't any people flocking from the churches to join the Jesus movement churches. That happened later on after it became an institution. And then all the churches were trying to copy what was going on and get a rock band and everything like that. Then it became a formula to be repeated, right? But at the at the time, this is what at the time there there was no uh, it was the music wasn't played on the radio, it wasn't sold in the bookstores, and it wasn't um, allowed in the churches. Um, you, you you must have known that. I was shown the door myself just because of the length of my hair and beard, you know, mm -hmm. very well, um, good Bible teaching um, Baptist church. <laughs> Cut your hair or else don't come back. <laughs> As an aside, if you're in Florida, you can go to New Smyrna. It's a city called New Smyrna Beach, right by Daytona. Yeah, you wonder how much persecution they're enduring yeah. there. Yeah, it's, it's a nice but... place to get out of the craziness of Daytona, <clears throat> go down to New okay. Smyrna. Anyways, some will be. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to rush through this. Okay. But some will be. In, some will be. Uh, some of you will go to prison. The devil is about to throw some of you in prison, and then finally, some of you will be even called to give your lives and be faithful unto death. And that's what happened to Polycarp. Now, I, I didn't know this until I, I came on, on this um, book by John Stott. But, but actually. Polycarp was installed as the Bishop of Smyrna by St. John himself, John the Apostle. Polycarp would have been alive at the time this letter was written, at the time the Revelation was written. He would have been a younger, a younger man or a boy, but he was known, um, and Jesus was giving this letter to John about the church here in Smyrna and about everything they were doing, he, and he, to, to Christ, this is this is the this church here at Smyrna is a precious jewel to me. Why not, you know, it's like you could say my one of my favorite kids. It's not that he has favorites, but I'm gonna I have a special place in, for them because they their heart is towards me, and they're forsaking all the world, and the world is forsaking them, and I'm, so I'm calling them. I'm, 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 I'm putting my arms around them. And they are going to go, some of them are even going to go the full way of martyrdom. Well, that's what happened to Polycarp. He was martyred. And it describes the martyrdom of Polycarp, again, who was alive at the time that Revelation 3 was written and who uh, was installed by the Apostle John as the bishop there. Polycarp Later on, I think he said it was around 156 A.D. In fact, he gives the date, February 22nd, 156 A.D. The bishop was, um, was flanked. He was tracked down um, in a hiding place. They, I'll, I'll give you the short version. It's like a whole page long. And basically, they, they arrested him. They took him in. They, they took him before the council of... Caesar, the Roman amphitheater, right there in front of everybody, told him to recant, uh, if deny your um, deny your Christ and swear your allegiance to Caesar, or we're throwing you to the lions. And we can do that, and we're going to do that. And he said, "I'm sorry, but um, I'm not going to do that." Polycarp replied, "86 years I've served him, and he's done never done me any wrong. How then can I blaspheme my King who saved me?" The proconsul then persisted, swear by the genius of Caesar, I have these wild beasts, if you do not change your mind, I'll throw you to them. Bid them come, Polycarp said. 
as you despise the beast unless you change your mind I'll make you then I'll make you be destroyed by by fire so now he says um, the Roman uh, governor um, at um, in that province there says to him the all right all right if you don't want the beast I'll give you fire <clears throat> um, they'll, they'll burn him at the stake um, which, by the way, I just read something this last week that said that there's the two most painful... This was a biologist, and it was on a, on a page that had to do with abortion. And it, it's, and, and it was a doctor that had, had, had said something that the two most painful, physically painful things that can happen to the human body are one, childbirth, and two, being burned alive. And so they said, all right... Um, being thrown to the lions is, is kindness compared to being burned at the stake. We're going to burn you at the stake if you don't recant. So they said, um, Polycarp says, go ahead and start the fire. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, infuriated that the Jews and Gentiles gathered wood for the pile, Polycarp stood by the stake and he asked, it not, not, he, he asked not to be fastened to it. You don't have to tie me here. I'm going to, I'll stand here. And, and, he, and, and he began to pray, O God, Lord, Almighty God, Father of beloved Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received a knowledge of thee, I thank you that thou hast thought me worthy this day and this hour to share the cup of thy Christ among the number of thy witnesses. The fire was kindled, but the wind blew and drove the flames away from his body. <laughs> um, so that... Uh, it, it was going away from him. So a soldier, a Roman soldier, came up and put him out of his misery with the sword um, right there. So he, uh, it was as an act of mercy, he died quickly. And that's how he was uh, martyred. So it's interesting that Jesus himself predicted the martyrdom of the most uh, prominent Christians in in this church at Smyrna, and he was probably thinking of Polycarp because he was already alive at the time, was um, installed by John as its bishop, and then was taken to the, um, to the point of ending his life that way. So there's the background. It's good to read some backgrounds, uh, fill in the histories of um, these seven churches if you want to read more. Um, get a hold of what Christ thinks of the churches. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, boy, I could go on with this for the rest of the half hour. Um, but the two things that John, uh, excuse me, that Paul exhorts in the last chapter of Thessalonians, let's, let's read about that. Chapter 3. And Father, Lord, we ask that, Lord, you add your blessing, Lord, to your words and let your words be life and truth to our hearts and quicken by your spirit, Lord, that our minds will be occupied with the truth and the things above and that we'll hear your voice and that we'll be moved and changed because we've been in your presence and we know and see the hour in which we live. Help us to have the same love for you and the fervor that those men of God of old who knew that their citizenship was not in this life, in this world, but in the one who made it, who calls us apart and sets us apart, and who's coming again to bring his kingdom and bring us, Lord, into, into that kingdom. Do not let us love this present world and the things that are in it, Lord, but love your kingdom and love you, Father, first. And love one another only in, in terms of um, and because of the love that you first given to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Chapter 3, finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may rapidly spread and be honored just as it was with you. Here's, his, here's Paul's uh, prayer requests. We want the word of Christ, the message of the gospel to be spread faster and quicker more than ever. That should be our prayer and at the end of this age, at the end of, um, as we see the United States in the state. 
it's in chaos, really. The news cycles are, it's just <coughs> utter, utter chaos. Everybody agrees that it's nothing but hostility and argument, but it's, it's chaos spiritually. Um, pray that the gospel would be furthered and uh, uh, rapidly and clearly and powerfully more than ever. And Christ be honored just as it was, the same way as it was with you guys. Now Thessalonica, Thessalonica if you remember, was also a church under persecution. <clears throat> Both these letters remind us of that and he's, his encouragement to them. It was the persecution that the Thessalonians endured that, um, that spurred Paul to write about the second coming and to keep their eyes on this is part of his will. His kingdom is coming. So pray that the gospel would be, would be spread more clearly and rapidly than, than, than ever. Pray that we may be delivered from the from the hand of the wicked one and the evil men. So we're not, you know, um, spending any more time in jail except what the Lord would have us and that the Lord would want us there, but, but we're not being sidelined for the preaching and the furtherance of the gospel. And, um, <clears throat> but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you're doing and will continue to do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. And then comes his warnings against being idle. Don't be sitting on your hands and don't be sitting at home just watching the Steve TV screens as the cities are burning. Be about the Father's business, both with the ministry of the gospel and being a helping hand to those that are suffering. Don't be idle. Um, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, this is a, a very forceful imperative by the apostle, to keep away from every brother who is idle. He's, he's the Monday morning quarterback He's the, we're the political commentators ad nauseum um, talking about why all of the mess that things are happening are happening. But are we doing anything to help and change the communities that we live in? If we're not active in doing it, then for the most part, we should keep our mouths shut. Don't be the one who is talking but not acting. Love is an action. It is a choice. But remember Paul, what Paul said earlier. He said, let, let us not love in word or rhetoric, but in deed and in truth. You're not really loving truly unless you're loving it with your feet and your hands and action. Um, we have to keep that in mind. So what he's saying is, don't even hang around the person that is idle and isn't doing anything. Now, now that, I know some people are shut-ins and they're, you know, you, you, you've got disabilities and you can't do anything. You've got, that's, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those that, that can and should be helping others but are not, but are content to sit on the sidelines and be served and just talk about what everybody else is doing wrong and also, our busy bodies, he's about to say, they're not, instead of being involved in the solution, they're involved in other people's affairs. And, uh, and they become busy bodies, and they're, then they become, then that becomes divisive, and they become part of the problem. What does Paul say? Now, these are believers. He says, don't hang around them. And the way to change somebody, it's like you're, it's like I can't be around somebody who wants to eat up all of my time in things that are wasteful, not productive, not edifying, just depressing, and that are keeping me from doing things that should be done and can be done to edify others and to win others to Christ. Don't waste your time with those who are doing it. It's not, and that itself, Paul says, will be a uh, rebuke to that person. Well, geez, they don't have time for me. Well, yes, we do. Get on board and come join us and, and be uh, serving the Lord. 
That's what Paul says to doing that. They will be shamed because you're helping. I'm not going to get, it's like Nehemiah, I'm not going to get down off that wall and have this conversation with you. Hand me another brick. We can talk about it as we're serving with our swords at our side because the enemy might strike at any time. But the time is not to be idle. And if, the one, if, if they refuse to be chastened about that, then leave them behind. And then that itself, it's like um, uh, not considering somebody as part of the, of the body, as a member of what your team is, is going to itself be a, um, a wake-up call to them that they're not about. They're going to see you serving the Lord. They're going to see the wicked not serving the Lord. They're going to see themselves in the middle not doing anything. They're going to say, geez, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm cursing the darkness, but I'm not serving in the light either. Geez, I'm, maybe I better get busy and, you know, make a choice. Whose side am I on? There isn't going to be a, cho a, cha a chance for anybody standing in the middle when Jesus comes. It's going to be the sheep and the goats, the light and the darkness. Make your choice now and stand in it and walk in it and march in it. That's what Paul is saying here, this warning against idleness. For you yourselves know how, we ought to, how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day. We labored, we toiled so that we, we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help. We could have taken your help, you know, and just... Um, and not worried about paying for our own way and paying for our own room and board. Um, but we did this in order to make ourselves an example to you, a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, that's the key word is will, he ain't going to, as long as, as, long as there's a free check coming in, why should I go to work? Rather sit home. Um, you know, sometimes, <laughs> so, hey, I've earned my retirement. <laughs> um, God wants us not idle, I think, even in our retirement. As long as I can breathe, and as long as I can move my body, I'm going to move it and do the things that are going to further the kingdom as long as God gives me breath. If a man doesn't work, he shall not eat. Didn't Moses, that was, Moses made that decree when they were in the wilderness? Because some people didn't want to go pick up the manna. Yeah, God's I, giving it to them. Yeah, they didn't want to pick it up and carry, bring it to their mouth. Yeah. So they got motivated. <laughs> Hunger is a really good motivator. Mm -hmm. And yeah. obviously he's talking yeah. about able-bodied people. You know? Right. So like H.L. Mencken said in the 20s, there's, there's two kinds of people, those who work and those who will let you work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, what does that say about socialism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'll just work together. <laughs> But it's a simple welfare plan, right? Real simple. The, the followers that flock after that mm -hmm. are idle people. Make no mistake about it. The book of Proverbs calls that person a wicked person. It is evil. Mm -hmm. It is a person. It is the difference between Cain and Abel. It, it is the difference between um, um, those that wanted the blessing, but... but um, the guy that sold his inheritance for one meal, Esau. Yeah. That he's he's a wicked man. He he the the value of of who he was and what he was called to meant nothing to him. Just give me my next meal. That, that it's called evil. It's demanding that God, you exist to take care of me. It's seeing God as your servant. And now now we. That, you know, you have to have a heart for God and a desire and a hunger for the scriptures in order to see what's plainly before you, to him who has ears to hear, to whom has eyes to see. Otherwise, you're just going to see it just that's a, what a lazy dude he is. But it's more than lazy. It's a wickedness that comes from the heart of man that demands that God do for me. Hey, you made me. It's your job to support me. Oh, no, you don't. You're of age now, get a job. Anybody see the forge, by the way? <laughs> Priscilla Schneider has to kick her 19-year-old son out if he doesn't get a job because he's sitting home all day and all night playing video games on it. And it's a great movie, you gotta see it. 
you gotta see What's it. it called? The, the Forge. Forge. And it's about a, um, a young black kid that, um, it's at the, it just came out Friday, and um, you got to see it. He, he turns his life around, the Lord gets a hold of his life and turns him around. This is very well acted. And the Forge is a, is a kind of like a, a, a fellowship of, 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 of men who come together to mentor and disciple other young men. And uh, I won't tell you the stories that, that behind it. It's just tremendously powerful. And he ends up getting a job with, uh, with, the, with an older man who owns this company, a fitness company. And this, um, his uh, stipulation is, is that he would come twice a week for mentoring. And he gets mentored by this guy. You know, he doesn't have a father. He hates his dad. Um, and he's being raised only by his mother. Who's a Christian, and that the story unfolds that he's discipled by this guy, and his his life completely changes around, and you right, see. You're telling this to me too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't tell any of the details. There's there's an elderly man in the city of Detroit who has a similar thing going on. It's been going on since before COVID. It's called he calls it the Kings of Abdul, and he uses um, martial arts to teach young fatherless boys self-discipline, but they learn scripture too, yes. and they match yeah, those that's, boys, yeah. That, that's great. Now, the, the, you're going to see this movie, this is one of the best. It is strong. It is not entertainment, Christian entertainment, like most a lot of Christian movies you see. It is a real Christian film with the message of, and the gospel is in it clearly, and that we're called to disciple one another. So it's on the theaters yeah. in hell? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Eric in Texas interviewed her Friday night on the show. Priscilla, hmm? Yeah. Just, just tremendous. Just absolutely powerful. Good. It'll bring you to tears Good. several times. We need, we need movies like that. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, about idleness, well, there's, there's one there about, about discipleship. We're called a disciple and snatch some out of the fire. Um, we hear that some of you are idle, verse 11, they're, they're not busy, but they're busy bodies. In other words, you're not, you're not uh, active with your hands, with your time, the use of your time, your talents, your, um, and yourself. Find some, God, ask God every day, what would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? Provide opportunities for me to witness to you. Help me to serve you in some kind of way. If you put if you put yourself at his disposal, he will the, the opportunities will flood your way. More so than you'll be able to handle, and then you'll be asking God for the equipment in order to do this and to do that, which is bigger than, than you can possibly handle. And then you might be finding yourself recruiting other people for a work bigger than you. That's the way the Lord works. He works with people who have a vision, and he qualifies the called. He doesn't call, call the qualified. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down, earn the bread they eat. As for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. Don't get into the idea. And this is where you're going to get this mentality from those who are idle. You know what? I'm, I'm do, I've done the right thing and I never see the results. I'm really getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of serving, serving, serving that person. Maybe you're married to somebody who's not a believer, or you have a child, a wayward child who's not a believer, or a parent, and I don't see any results, but things get worse, and I'm really tired of it. And he's saying, don't get weary of doing the right thing. You're serving the Lord Christ in your service to that person. And to that to those ones leave the results to him serve because of your love and your joy to Christ he and trust look the seed that's planted can't help but have some effect of bearing fruit and God will use it um, I don't know whether that person's going to be saved or not Paul says that in first Corinthians when he talks about somebody who's married to an unbeliever I don't know whether they're going to be saved, but they'll be sanctified, and the word of God will not return empty-handed or void. But as for you, don't let yourself, your heart, be discouraged because of the results that you do or don't see, because that is that kind of thinking comes from 
the idle and those who aren't doing the work. When you are serving the Lord, your joy and the fulfillment of just having blessed somebody else is itself enough of a reward that I can't wait to do it again the next time. Only next time, Lord, show me how I can do it even more effectively so that this person will know that it isn't me, but it's you and your presence that's reaching out to them. That's my motivation and my desire. So if anybody, um, then he goes on to say, um, if anyone doesn't obey our instructions in this letter, takes in these instructions and these encouragements and exhortations that he's giving, um, take notice of that person like that, hey, this guy's, you know, he's not getting with it. He's staying off by himself, and he's, he's, he's got an excuse and a reason for everything um, of not being involved with um, uh, service to Christ and service to the body. Then don't associate with that person. Pull away from them in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. He's still a brother. And then the, the final... Um, salutation. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I told you that each one of these, that was a, that was a class by itself. Just let me, let me mention um, the last chapter of this. The chapter, the rapture in the seven churches of Revelation and I'm going to have to re I'm going to just summarize this. It's only about like, two, one, about six pages, but let me summarize this real quick. Going back to hindsight, he's Mark Kirk was going to focus on the Church of Philadelphia, which is the other of the two churches that did not receive a rebuke in the seven churches. Many churches in the um, Theologians we call the Philadelphia the Rapture Church. Um, if you look at the churches, it has not only seven cities in Asia Minor that to whom um, Christ sent John with these letters, but as actual periods of history from the first century church, which would be represented by Ephesus, to the last generation church represented by Laodicea. Philadelphia would be the one just before it called the Rapture Church. If the Rapture, I'm at the bottom of page 49, if the Rapture is an accurate teaching of the seven churches of Revelation represents all periods of church history based on what we've already seen of God's removing his people from the wrath to come, we would expect to see the second to the last church being removed from the hour of trial that will come upon this entire world known as the Great Tribulation. I believe that is exactly what we see in the seven churches. Quoting Revelation 4, which is the first, um, I've talked about this one before, <clears throat> right after the letters to the seven churches, John is translated up into the heavenlies and he hears a trumpet <coughs> speaking to him with the words, come up here and I will show you the things that must take place after this. And immediately he sees, he's in the spirit and he sees the throne in heaven and the one who sat on the throne. And then the, and then the seven um, seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of judgment that are coming on the earth. Um, let's go down to page 51. The rapture is portrayed in the Jewish wedding. I, aside from the word of God, I believe the most in, the intimate and convincing proofs of the rapture that God has given us lies in the Jewish culture and specifically in the wedding ceremony. How interesting, since the rapture is, in essence, the Lord's wedding day, when he's united with the bride as she comes to him and he takes her to his father's house. Here's where... Uh, the Jewish, how were the wet Jewish weddings observed in the Lord's day? And he's, here's the bullet points. A, the marriage was prearranged or foreordained by the father in conjunction with the other family, sometimes even before the children were even born. B, 
When the children had come of age, a price was paid for the bride and would serve as a dowry for her provision in case the groom were to die or, some, or become disabled to, to provide for her. C. The families were then gathered at the city gate before the city officials to ensure everything was done legally and with witnesses. And D. Next, the covenant of marriage was read aloud to make certain the bride fully understood the agreement. There was a covenant. E. After the covenant was read, a glass of wine was poured and offered to the bride and a seal of the covenant to see if she would accept or reject this offer. You see, even though the union was all prearranged and foreordained, the final choice was still left up to the bride. She alone had to decide whether she's going to accept or reject this marriage proposal. And then, if she rejects it, the marriage was called off despite being foreordained long before. Everyone present, especially the groom, needed to know that she herself wanted this marriage, that she chose it, that she desired it. This would not only prove her genuine love for the groom, but would also show that she was not being forced into something without her consent. Hence, she alone was left with the final choice and decision as to whether the marriage would move forward or not. If she accepted the cup, the groom would then say, I will not drink of the cup of this wine again until I drink it with you in my father's house. Then the gifts were given to the bride and to the groom, followed by the rejoicing and the time of preparation for the marriage. Well, we're, I hear the music playing, the sound of the trumpet, the sackbut. The... Did you say sackbut? <laughs> Daniel chapter two. <laughs> Chapter 3. Um, yeah. You're, you're the only person I know who would ever know that word. <laughs> I, I, I know it. That's one of my I've favorite. I've actually seen the sackbutt play. It's one of my favorite instruments. There's a movie um, called Beneath the Wrath that goes into all that. It's an excellent film. If anybody wants the link, I can find it. If you, if you haven't read now, this chapter, chapter 5 about the wedding feast, right. it goes so all, right along. And the, cool. the father's house was pre he uh, uh, the place was prepared at the father's house, but were separate quarters. It was uh, it was in the father's estate, but it was the it was the son's quarters for for the bride and for the wedding. And it, it um, he comes to get her, and there's a period of seven days of feasting that happened there. There's the seven years before it is returned with the bride. It so pictures why the rapture would be different and separate and before uh, the coming in that period of seven years of wrath on the earth that is for the Jewish nation to bring them to faith in the Messiah while the wedding is, the feast is happening. So I uh, um, if you haven't get the rest of that chapter. Um, my apologies we're, we're five minutes behind but uh, um, we will um, not see you then. Um, Except at church. Right. Um, we're going on vacation. Next week? Did yeah. we, we said we were going to take off next week, the next two weeks yeah. Yeah. Um, for um, a break in between, and then we're going to come back, and then we'll start the book of Genesis. Let so, us know the so date for tuned. sure. I thought we were getting three hours. Yeah, oh, I'm look, looking forward to that one, too. We've got some a couple of great films, state of the art. Um, so Lord, we're just um, thankful, Lord. I thank you, Father, for this for this body and for these uh, men and women here and for their hearts of love and service to you, Lord, and their faithfulness and diligence, Lord, to be studying your word and in your word daily and, uh, in, and as part of our class and our fellowship here together. I thank you, Lord, that we have this fellowship around you and who you are and what, how you provide for us. We ask, Lord, that you would increase our fruitfulness for you and our vision and our fire for you, Lord, in these days and in these weeks and in these months and in the time we have left here, that, Lord, many will come into the kingdom of God. Bless our time of worship, Father, together this morning and the rest of our fellowship together around your table. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.